It was on stages like this where I learned to deeply listen. As a conductor, I would surround myself with musicians, and together we would listen our way into this intricate dance of co-creation. And every set of ears was critical in that process. And I was so moved by the beauty that I would experience when we listened deeply that way. But the music didn't always sound beautiful. I mean, there were times when we were out of tune or we were out of sync, and the music sounded harsh. But when that happened, we paused, and we listened to the space between us. Because when pitches don't align with each other, there are these beats in the air. It's like this interference, this clashing of the frequencies. And as the pitches come more into alignment, the beats start to slow down. And eventually, they go away, and you're just left with this smooth, sweet sound. And in that process, there's no sense that somebody's right and somebody's wrong. The goal is simply to come into alignment. I was moved by the beauty that I heard while I got to listen from the podium, and I wanted to experience that beauty in other places of my life, especially in the places where beauty was hardest to find. Like prisons, schools, homeless shelters. So I started to wonder: Can listening be a pathway to beauty once I step off the podium? Well, I, I wanted to find out. And so about 14 years ago, I walked out of the concert hall, and I walked into Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communication trainings. And there, I learned that it's the quality of listening that is the key to hearing what people care about, no matter how they express it through their words or in their actions. I learned that listening is seeing the world from someone else's perspective, but not necessarily agreeing with it. And I learned that we can come back into sync with one another. We can transform those beats of disconnection. Into a sweet music of understanding and compassion, through conversation alone, and that was the beauty that I was looking for off the podium. What I didn't realize was how big the scale of possibility really was, because we can all listen differently in this world and change the course of events. Listening. Is fundamental to dialogue, and dialogue is a prerequisite to change. So, what would happen if we all listened our way into a new era of conversation, where everyone wins when the conversations are done? It was when I went into men's and women's prisons with the Freedom Project that I really began to understand just how listening to what people care about can transform lives, even lives in prison. And I realized that it was really their desperation to be heard for their pain that landed many of those men and women behind bars. One time, I was in the men's prison, and there was one man in particular in a group of about 30 of us who was really hungry for some connection with his own daughter. And so I took on the role of his daughter in a role play, and together we listened to try to figure out what it was that she might be wanting. And so, in the role play, this man kept offering to buy me CDs and other things, hoping to repair that broken relationship. But finally, as his daughter, I just blurted out and I said, "Dad, I don't want you to buy me anything. Like it's just talking like this, having you hear what's important to me. That's what I've wanted my whole life. I want you to see me and know me for who I am, and I want to know you." That's what I'm hungry for. And something happened in that man's eyes at that moment, and then he went completely silent. And he stayed silent for three days. And I thought, oh my God, like what have I done? But in the closing circle of our workshop, he read a letter that he had written to all of us. And in that letter, he said. I never realized that my presence could matter to another person. 
I never realized I had value. He spoke for many of the men in that room. And it seems a little strange, but somehow when one person is heard, we're all changed. And several of the men in that workshop then reached out beyond the razor wire and beyond the walls to their own sons and daughters in attempts to restore relationships that had been ruptured by violence. Recently, one of the men received correspondence from his daughter, and in that correspondence, she was lashing out in a lot of pain. He took a deep breath. He remembered how precious that connection was to him. And then he responded with empathy. She wrote back, sorry, Dad. It's just that you were the only person that I knew would actually hear me, and I really needed to vent. But you're listening, your understanding helped me find a way forward. So I love you. Now, it's experiences like these that remind us listening restores relationship. And it restores the sense that every life matters. It restores the sense of wholeness by weaving those fragmented perspectives back together again. It's our willingness to listen that just might shift things. It might make what seems impossible, possible. It's not unusual for prison workshops to end with someone saying, wow, if I would have known this when I was growing up, I wouldn't be here today. When I first heard that, I thought, really? Like, could that be true? What if we listened to our youth and heard what was really important to them? Would it support them in making some life-serving choices that would keep them out of prison? Well, I was thinking about that as I volunteered with a fourth grade classroom. I was working with a 10-year-old boy who said, you know what, it doesn't really matter if I do this assignment or not. Now, most of us, we would be tempted, right, to say something like, oh, sure, you can do it, or to stress the importance of doing homework, right? But in that moment, I chose to listen to the meaning behind the words. And so I asked him maybe if it seemed kind of pointless. and Maybe did he just want to have something that was more useful in his life? He said, yeah, most of it seemed like a waste of time. So I asked if he'd rather be spending his time hanging out with his friends. And that's when he told me he didn't have any friends, that the other kids at the school were being mean to him. And so I guessed at that point that maybe that was a lonely place for him to be in, wondered if he wanted it to be different. And he told me it was going to be different. He wasn't coming back, that he was going to kill himself. Now, it's really hard to hear something like that and not react with alarm not to jump up and call in the teachers and the parents and the social workers, but I chose to keep listening because I knew that he needed companionship then more than ever. And so I asked him if maybe the hurt felt so big because he wanted friends and a sense of belonging, and did he just want that hurt to go away? He said, yeah, that was true. And then I wondered if he wanted other people to know how much he was hurting to know what that was like for him. He said, well, that would be pretty much impossible because no one cares. So I asked him, do you have a sense right now that I care? And he said, yeah, I guess you do because you're listening to me. But you know, no one else seems to even notice. Like, they just want me to do whatever it is they want me to do. So in a sense, that boy was in his own kind of prison, locked into the thinking that it was his performance rather than his feelings that mattered. So I checked it out and I said, hey, if I'm getting you right, are you telling me that you would like people to know what's going on on the inside, care more about that than they do about the homework? And he nodded. So I asked him, do you want to know what's going on inside me right now? I think I'm wanting the same things that you're wanting. I'd like you to have friends that you can talk to about your feelings, and I'd like you to know that people care. 
And I'm pretty sure that we can find a way to help make this hurt go away. That'll be a lot better than you hurting yourself. Do you want to explore that with me? And we did. This boy received the ongoing support that he needed. He finished school, he's developing his art form, and he's got a job in the community now. Someone tuning in and listening without trying to give advice or to fix it was pivotal for him during that dark time. The cost to me, about 20 minutes of my time. There was no big budget of grant writing that was necessary. No committee's work or no gathering of musicians together. And no waiting for months and months until all the logistics got in place until we could make music. All it took was making a choice at the moment that the opportunity rose to give my full presence to this boy's feelings and his needs, to his despair and his dreams, and to show up with authenticity and love. And that part was easy, because when we listen, we can't help but love. There was another time in my life when I really treasured the power of listening. And that was when my own father journeyed through dementia. Now, some other people in his life at the time said that they lost him years earlier because they lost access to the man that they knew. But rather than give up on our relationship, I chose to listen to the meaning behind his words rather than the facts. And we had a sweet connection that lasted through his final years. One of the last conversations that I had with my 83-year-old father before he died started when he leaned forward and he whispered, hey, I've decided not to retire. <laughs> and I said, really, Dad? Is that because you loved your life as a minister and you're so grateful to have lived a life that was filled with meaning and purpose? That's it, he said. And now you and your brother are carrying on that work. Mm. So when you see me going into prisons and you see my brother helping to make the world a safer place, are you delighted maybe that you've been able to pass your values down to us? Is that what you mean? That's it exactly, he said. And I'm so proud of you both. And at that moment, he leaned forward and he kissed me like he had done so many times during my life. Because I was able to hear the dreams in his heart that were not clouded by the dementia in his mind, our connection remained vibrant and clear. Now, as you've heard in so many of these stories, listening is not necessarily the absence of talking, but it is the foundation of talking. I listen my way into the words that I'm going to say. I listen to the beating of my own heart. Like, are my words ringing true? Are they expressing what I most care about? Do I feel flushed with excitement? Or is my throat tight because I'm holding something back? All of these are beautiful moments when I'm deeply listening to myself. When I'm listening to the music that's inside me about what I most care about and letting that flow into my presence and my words. Now, I've been studying listening for decades and only to discover that listening is nothing that we really need to study. It's our natural birthright, like we're all wired for it. And any one of us can lean forward in, into a conversation and say, now, what is it that you'd like me to hear that you don't think I've heard yet? And any one of us can let go of our stories and our assumptions and just give our full presence to what matters most. So to be truthful, one of the reasons that I'm standing here trying to put words to something that lives beyond words it's because I believe that we need one another. And listening is the most powerful act of love that I know. Thank you for listening.